If you'll take your Bibles and turn over to Exodus chapter 12 and verse 37. Mark had covered the last time the institution of the Passover and, and the complete resetting of the Jewish year is what it was. And he made that the beginning of the months for them. And God totally reorganized their entire calendar. And very soon from here, the events of their year to start to direct them and teach them of salvation. And God begins to map out in feasts and ordinances for them to follow and to participate in that actually are a foreshadowing of how he's going to actually carry out the events of this world and bring this world to an end. And that sounds bad, but then how he's also going to bring about a new world, a new heaven and a new earth. And so it's not, it's not a bad story, it's a good story. And today we get to see a little bit of that, what he did and how he instructed them and, and what it was like for them to leave out of Egypt, to leave out of that illustration of bondage to sin, uh, if you just study the, the language carefully, the house of sin, that Egypt was the house of sin. And I, I'll just remind you so we can hang on to the illustration that God gave that that the Israelites in bondage in Egypt is an illustration of mankind's bondage to sin. And we are unable to do anything about that bondage, and we're stuck in that bondage, and we're unable to deliver ourselves. And with a mighty hand and great works, God brought about that delivery, and he brought about it in such a dramatic way that nobody could look back and say, well, you know, I think things just fell together. Nevertheless, there are people today that say that this world just fell together, you know, that, you know, just came together. And, you know, science itself contradicts uh, itself, you know, and within itself, there's th three itselfs in one sentence that's bad, but, you know, you all know what I mean. And constantly, you know, we, we understand in science that design is by intelligence, yet we deny the, the design of this world by intelligence in the scientific world. I, my undergrad is in science. Before you, you know, anybody wants to crucify me for all of that, and Jennifer and I both had to endure four years of that stuff, you know, and how how science says that this world came to be. But we could do just the same, you know, if we were to get to that point that we thought that maybe we delivered ourselves from sin, and over and over, and even today we'll see in some of the feasts like. Um, you know, in the Feast of Trumpets. You know, the, the emphasis there was like, you can do no work. You can do no work. You can't do anything. And you couldn't do anything to deliver themselves from Egypt. And we can't do anything to deliver ourselves from sin, but receive him and to be delivered of, of him. Now, remember that he said in leaving Egypt that they weren't to go out and to be free agents, he said, but the, the specifications given unto Pharaoh and unto the Israelites were that you would go into the wilderness and serve, right? Worship, actually, I think it's to worship the Lord, but it's worship, serve, or if you really want to know the word, it means to slave, to slave unto the Lord. And, you know, you may think that that sounds bad, but he, listen, he's, he's the best taskmaster there is. He's the one that cares for you, and indeed he is your owner because you're purchased, right, by the blood of Christ that your slavery, your indebtedness is transferred from the God of this world and unto sin and your flesh, and your ownership is transferred unto him when you're redeemed by the blood of Christ. And so now you become the doulos, like the New Testament refers to us as, the bond slaves of Christ. And so that is what's coming about in their life as they go through this experience, although they do not have the hindsight that we do, but we have a great benefit to see back and to understand what it all means. The New Testament's rather clear about all of these things and its meaning. Now, verse 37 of chapter 12, he says, Then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot, about 600,000 men on foot, besides children. A mixed multitude went up with them also, and flocks and herds, a great deal of livestock. 
And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were driven out of the land and could not wait, nor had they prepared provisions for themselves. Now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the four, uh, at the end of four hundred and thirty years on that very same day it came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night of solemn observance to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord a solemn observance for the, all the children of Israel throughout their generations. Let's pray, Father. God, may this be Lord for. The benefit of those who are yours, God, and I pray, Father, for my speech, that it would be both directed and restricted by you. And Lord, may you forbid that I give any false sense of you, God, or misrepresent you in any way. Lord, teach us, Father, from your own word. We are here to present ourselves before you, God. I pray for our hearts. God, that they might be tendered by your word and might be receiving of your word, Lord, that we might first apply it even to ourselves. God, before we point out to the world around us, let us be sons and daughters that are well-pleasing unto you, and may we learn from every word that proceeds from your mouth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now this was them leaving, and this was God's work, and this was by God's hand, and it was done God's way. And he said that they journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot, about 600,000 men on foot. And uh, actually, I think the exact number is given somewhere else, something like 6, 603,055 or some particular number. But, but you, know, you need to know this, that often the Bible gives generalities. It will say about 600,000 men. And somebody will find in another place, well, 603,355. They're like, oh no, oh no, you know, there's a contradiction to the Bible. And it does say about. There's a preposition there, you know. There's, even in Hebrew, you can go and you can see that it was a generality given. And this is not the only place, you know. You need to be careful. And you need to be careful about reading Scripture, whether you do it in an accusative way or whether you're there to receive from Him instruction. But it says about 600,000 men. Uh, and this was just men. So guys that know a lot and study a lot and research a lot, they estimate anywhere from two to three million because it's just men. And actually, if you go further in Scripture, it specifies that that was men over the age of 20. Now, if, you know, every man had one wife and a couple kids, well, you can see how that could go to two to three million really carefully, quickly. And so it was a great number. It was a huge number. It was a logistical nightmare, if you think about it. Historians read this, and they take it, you know, I mean, secular historians read it, and they, they take it enough to believe that it was so and that the numbers are so, yet they're mar- they marvel, like, how in the world was a movement like that even done? And then they sit there and try to figure out how they try to explain away the miracle of God. And I'd love to say that it's just secular historians, but you find... Seminary professors <laughs> and uh, so-called Bible scholars trying to logically describe these things. And you say, well, you know, they, they probably had this, and it might have, you know, done this. You know, and they come up with ways, and just like Jonah and the sea monster that swallowed him, whatever it was, the dog, whatever that is. And, uh, you know, and then they try to rationalize, and it's like, no. Nah, You've got to accept the miracles of God if you're going to believe Him, if you're going to read Scripture. I mean, how in the world are you going to be redeemed, right, by a hypostatic union, both man and God, Jesus incarnate, who was crucified and rose again on the third day and ascended into heaven at the right hand of the Father, if you don't believe in miracles? Like, man, you're in trouble salvation, I don't know that it's possible for you if you don't believe in miracles, because salvation is a miracle, and this people group, their delivery from Egypt is a miracle. They weren't warriors, although God begins to call them armies, you know. They were not, you know, set up with swords and shields and 
And in fact, God told him, hey, don't even have horses and chariots. I don't want it to be that way. I want it to be in such a way that everybody knows that it was my hand that did this. And so, boy, when you get into this and you get into the secular history, because it's not just the Bible that records this. We have secular history that records this. And historians wonder and they marvel, how in the world did the Jewish people come out of Egypt and how did they go into the land of Canaan, you know, where they were bigger, badder, and better, you know, warriors and people and all that stuff. And they try to figure it out. But it was by the miracle of God that he did this. And it says not only that, but did they go out, right? 600,000 men plus, you know, ladies and children. And he said also a mixed multitude went up with them also. And that is, you know, I would imagine other ethnic groups and all sorts of people, you know, in, that were intermingled in slavery with them in Egypt. I, there's all kinds, I would imagine, you know, that were slaves. And there was others also that were with them. And some of those all, we'll see later in the Pentateuch that they led the uh, Israelites astray. Also, a mixed multitude went up with them uh, and flocks and herds, a great deal of livestock, and they baked unleavened cakes. You know, it's, it's going to end up being the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Um, of the dough which they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared provisions for themselves. I can already hear the complaining. Right? Y'all ever, like, there's a church fellowship, and there's not enough chairs, and it's too hot in there, and we ran out of that kind of food, and I didn't get any of that dessert, you know, that, you know, you know, and, uh, like, you got rescued out of the ocean or something. You're complaining about the helicopter that picked you up. Oh, careful, right? It doesn't take too long to murmur, but you see that it, would just, it just wasn't all perfect, you know? It just, God didn't pull up in a bunch of stretched limos with the, you know, ice chest in there loaded up with Cokes and refreshments with some ho-hos in there, you know, and, and all this, you know, this stuff. And ideally, you know, it's, it, was, it was a little rough and tumble and bumpy, you know, and they didn't have time and this isn't working out. And listen, you got to go. And there's no time, right, to, to, to do all this, what they wanted to do. They could not wait, and nor had they prepared provisions for themselves. And this is a bad idea, right? Every strategist that you would talk to would be like, hey, this isn't going to work. You know, this isn't going. And, but listen, that, that is all over the work of God, the hand of God in your life, in the church. Constantly you'll find people that say, that's a bad idea. That's no good. You know, there was people that criticized me for opening this church very quickly. I think we were closed for three or four Sundays during COVID. And there was people that said, that's a bad idea. But, you know, there were some people that came here just for the very fact that we were open. And some of the growth that is here today is because of that very thing. You know, so I mean, be careful with the way you think and the way you think about things, because God doesn't do things according to man's logic. He just doesn't. Sometimes he intentionally does them contrary to God, you know, to man's logic, just so he can show himself to be God. You know, this for man is a logistical nightmare. For God, it's just right. It's just right. I, I just want to see, you know, so, you know, when, you know, when your wheel, spiritual wheel looks wobbly and you're thinking, boy, this is going bad, well, just hang on and, you know, and hang tight to God and, and stay on for the ride because he'll take you and he'll get you there. And he says, now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years, and it came to pass at the end of that 430 years, on the very same day, it came to pass that all of the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Like, what do we sign up for, God? I thought this was just going to be freedom, right? But no, that an army. I think it's probably a lot like Gideon. You know, hey, mighty man of valor, as you're hiding from the Midianites threshing, you know, and he didn't completely disclose to Gideon and roll up to him and say, hey, man, I'm going to boil you down to 300,000 and send you against hundreds of thousands. I know what Gideon was He's like. Nope. You know, honestly, I have to say, if God disclosed to me every heartache and pain and trouble and difficulty in the ministry 20-something years ago when he called me to the ministry, I probably would have bowed out as well. You know, he, do he doesn't tell us all of that stuff. Did you tell your little kids they were going to get... Shots when they on the way to the doctor. Now you're going to get a shot. You know, you're like, no, nope, let's just keep it quiet. You know, <laughs> I'll direct you. You're in my hand. And I won't let any harm come unto you. There might be some things that hurt. But I'll not let any harm 
come unto you. And now he begins to call them armies of the Lord. And they went out from the land of Egypt. And, and it's a solemn night of observance. But I want to go back up to that thing. They went from Ramses to Sukkot to booth or to tabernacle or to a tent or to uh, temporary shelter or however you want to translate that word. Because when they got there, you know what they did? They dwelt in tents. And this was the first time in 430 years that they did this, you know, and well, not quite because there was a little bit of time at the very beginning of that 400 and something years that included their their nomadic Bedouin lifestyle. But, but here they've gone for hundreds of years, living in mud, clay homes, adobe homes, like they would be in the Southwest, you know, if whatever they could manage to put together was the poor man's home in Egypt. And they go and they dwell in temporary shelters, Sukkot, but that's not why it's called Sukkot. It was originally called Sukkot because Jacob came there and he dwelt there and he built booths. He built little shelters for his livestock. And he named the place Sukkot. And they came back to Sukkot, God's livestock, and they dwelt in Sukkot. <laughs> they dwelt in booths. And this is something, and a good deal of time now has passed from, from the Passover to this point, and they're traveling there and they're dwelling there. Because this goes on to be something rather exceptional. In fact, Josephus, who was a good Pharisee, Josephus said that the Feast of Booths was the most holy of all feasts. You're like, really? More than Passover? In fact, the Feast of Booths was really the final feast. It was really the, the, the last feast of the illustrations. And they came out of Egypt, and they dwelt in booths. And later, if you jump to Leviticus chapter 23, that's, that's a good chapter to remember, because it goes through all seven. It goes through all of them. It goes through all the feasts, and right in order, and you can just, you know, starts with the Sabbath, and then it goes to the Passover, and it goes, takes you through all of them. Leviticus 23, it's really good. But you find out that God ends up making a feast, an ordinance out of this as a memorial for him. But what was it and what was the beginning of it that they left Egypt and they dwelt in booths? Now, they probably had a little bit better home in Egypt than a booth. They probably had a little more comfort in their old homes. In fact, it was a couple times you know, in their sojourn during the wilderness, that they pointed out some things that they enjoyed more in Egypt than they did in the desert. You know, where we had meat, and we had this, and we had that, you know. We didn't have to drink bitter water, and, and they came up with all kinds of things to complain about. But this is, this is a reality of salvation and God's salvation, that we're going out, and we're, in this world, we're dwelling in a booth. This is not our home. Right? Is we're on a temporary setup. We're pilgrims. We're sojourners. You know, and, I, and as much as we like to build these big houses, I think it was Amy Carmichael, you know, she says, for as much as we call ourselves pilgrims, I do find that we spend quite amount of time and money, you know, putting together great things for ourselves here on this earth. And not any, it's something along those lines. You can go and find, you know, uh, Amy's quote, you know, exactly what it is. But it was along those lines. But that's what God called them out of there and into, you know, and, and be careful lest you complain. You need to go forward and see in what it was that God was illustrating and why he did it. But they were dwelling in a booth. Now, why would that booth be better than their adobe home in Egypt? I don't know if you know, but clay homes, you know, brick homes, adobe homes, they're halfway cool during the heat of the day. And you can, you know, get in there and all the... The mud and masonry that's around you, it's really insulative. You have the, the floor that never gets to see sunshine that remains fairly cool and it's somewhat bearable. I know that when we go camping and the sun is out, there's no worse place to be than under that fly or that, you know, you just 
feel the heat off of you. are like, well, I'm going to go get in the shade. And you get in there and you're like, this is the oven, man. This is not the shade, right? And it's, and it's hotter, but it's, it's not as comfortable and it's not as convenient. And God called them and they left Ramses and they went and they dwelled in tents. They dwelt in booths, shelters. But they were better. Why were they better? They were better because they were shelters with the presence of God. Remember, he went before them as that pillar, that cloud during the day, and at night, that pillar of fire, which glowed and it lit the ground and the area around them so that they could see. And as they went out and they had their booth, well, they had the presence of God, and it's better to dwell in the booth with the presence of God than it is to dwell in an adobe home under the bondage of, slave, of sin. And that's the truth of it. Now, that's better in that way, but listen, there, there's more to it. Because God called him out of there to dwell in these booths with his presence. And he goes on to make much more of an illustration out of this because you jump way forward. Now, this is, uh, this is the seventh month, right? Passover was the first month. The seventh month of the year, Tishri, let's see, the first day was the Feast of Trumpets. The tenth day was the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Right, the 15th day was the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths. And what does that mean, right? <laughs> okay, well, what does that mean, and how does it go? Well, there's an age there, right, between the Passover and that Feast of Trumpets, and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Booths. And what is it now? Well, we're living in a time in between. And the day is coming, you know, the Feast of Trumpets, well, that's going to be a trumpet sound for the rapture. And you know what time of the year that was? Well, this year it's like September 29th through October 4th or something like that is when it falls. It falls during harvest time. And I, well, what does that mean? Well, you know, there's going to be the blowing of a trumpet. And in the blowing of a trumpet, there's the Feast of Trumpets, there's going to be a great harvest. And indeed, there was a harvest. And that's one of the things that they were celebrating there at that time with those feasts was the harvest and the provision of God they celebrated the harvest, and then there was the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, in which they were atoned for. Don't you know that someday there's going to be a great harvest on this world, and with the trumpet sound that people rise up out of the grave, and right now they're justified, but they will be saved in that Day of Atonement when Christ stands to represent us. And not only that, but afterwards, Right? In the 15th day, there's the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles. And what does that mean? Well, later you get it better. You go on. When, when the Temple of Solomon was dedicated, guess what time of the year it was dedicated? Feast of Tabernacles. Why? Well, it's celebrating God's presence with his people. And when Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel went, and they were to rebuild after the Babylonian exile, and they were rebuilding the temple, and they had to dedicate it again. I think it's maybe Ezra chapter 3. That, you know, guess what, what time of the year that they made that dedication and that celebration? It was the Feast of Trumpets. You know, I mean, sorry, it was the, the Feast of Booths. Feast of Tabernacles. And they celebrated again God's presence with his people. And then even again at the preaching of Ezra later in the book of Nehemiah, when they had a great revival there at that temple of Zerubbabel, and they were celebrating there, and it was again that very same time of the year, the Feast of Booths. You're like, well, what does this all mean? Well, we see a very quick snapshot so many years ago that God called them out in order that they might be in his presence to dwell. Jesus said in John chapter 14, he said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there you may be also. And that was his intention, and that's his effort, and that's his provision. If you jump all the way forward, I think it's Revelation 21, is that right? A new heaven and a new earth. And what did, what did our brother John say? He said, Behold, the tabernacle of God is now with man. Ah, <laughs> that's what God eventually gets to. And that's the place that he gets to, you know, and you see the, the triad of, of those uh, feasts there at the harvest time that there's the trumpet call and the feast of trumpets that there's the day of atonement in which we're atoned for and and made righteous in the sight of God who now we're justified but we shall be saved is what Romans says 
And then not only that, but afterwards there is going to be that unhindered dwelling with God in the new heaven and the new earth. In the new Jerusalem, most particularly, it says. And if you, if you want another little place to add in there with your notes, go to Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah chapter 8 talks about this time and this ingathering, right? And this harvest as they come together and as they will be there. And he talks about that very thing. And, the, and I think it's, it's the very last, I think, verse of chapter 8 in Zechariah. And he said, the boy said, many people in that day will be grabbing the shirt tails, right? Of the Jews and saying, let us go with you. Let us go with you. We hear that God's dwelling is with you. Ah, oh, they went and they dwelt in Sukkot, in these booths, and listen, it was better. It was better for them, and even, even if you want to take it to a great extremity in terms of Moses, Moses left the palace of Pharaoh to dwell in a booth with the presence of God. It's better, right? It's better to have the presence of God in a shabby little tent than it is to have great riches in the bondage of sin and slavery. And that, well, I think it's Hebrews that describes it this way, all the passing pleasures of sin. That, that's what Moses gave it up for, to, to suffer affliction with the people of God. And we look further here. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, and this is back in um, Exodus chapter 12, verse 43, And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it, but every man's servant who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. A sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat it. In one house it shall be eaten. You shall not carry any of the flesh outside the house, nor shall you break any of its bones. Okay, there's, there's so many things to mention here. I have to just go one at a time. Of course, nor shall you break any of its bones is because of the particular reference to Christ that not one of his bones are broken, that he's the Passover lamb. You know, and that they went, when they went, when they went to, to make sure that he was going to die expediently on the cross and they were going to break his legs, that they got up to him and they said, nope, he's dead. All they did was shove the spear into his side and the blood and the water poured forth and they said, no, he's dead. Don't have to break his bones. And God took that all the way back into the beginning and he said, listen, this Passover lamb, you don't break any of his bones. Don't break any of his bones. Why? Because there's going to be a picture. And you're going to see, you know, thousands of years from now, that there's another Passover lamb whose bones are never broken. But he said, and it's interesting also about the Passover, that it was centered in the home, but celebrated by the community. That God, when he put forth these kind of ordinances, and even, even the Passover, that the Passover is centered in the home. Listen, the gospel of Christ is centered in the home, not in the government. It is centered in the home, and that's the way God would to have it. You know, it's by, by the patriarchy and by the dad and the leadership of the dad in the home, and it was to be taught in the home, and the home is the thing that is responsible for the Passover, not the government. It wasn't Moses that got up in front of the whole, you know, bunch and the crowd and, you know, and killed a Passover lamb. No, no, it was done in the home and it was the centrality of the Passover was in the home. And he said, you don't take it from home to home. He did say, if your home's not large enough, that your neighboring home can come and participate with you in it. But I think it's very interesting that it was centered in the home and on the home. But back to the thing about a, a sojourner and an uncircumcised person not being able to partake. And he says, verse 48, And when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover of the Lord, so, so it wasn't that they couldn't, but there's a requirement. He said, Let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be a native of the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. Well, one law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. Now back to that thing that God is no respecter of persons. God is not, there's no partiality with God. Remember that thing that Peter had to get, although it says it three times in the Old Testament, that God is no respecter of persons. But Peter, when he was on that house, Simon the Tanner in Joppa and God brought down that sheet, you know, of all kinds of unclean things. I mean, there were barbecue ba ba baby back ribs, you know, and there was some pork belly on there, and there was some shrimp and raw oysters, and, you know, y'all are getting hungry already, aren't you? You're like, you know, 
where are we going for lunch? You know? <laughs> yeah. Then he brought it all down, and the Lord said, take and eat. He said, no, I've never eaten anything that is unclean, God. No, I can't do this. And no one had to do it three times. And then what did he tell him? You shall not call unclean what I've made clean. And then, boy, that messenger came from the house of Cornelius, right? That centurion, I imagine some Italian square jaw, tough dude, right? And, and Peter went to his house, and he walked in. And what did he have to come to the conviction of? Now I know for a certainty that God is no respecter of persons. Don't get it in your head that there's this some kind of bias with God, you know, because the Old Testament, because he called somebody to represent him, because he called a nation to represent him in a particular and a unique way, just like he would call a pastor or an evangelist or something like that to represent him in a particular unique way, doesn't mean that they have any kind of extra leverage with the Lord that you don't. God's no respecter of persons, nor is he impressed. You think God was impressed with Billy Graham? No. Maybe in his faith, like he was about the Roman centurion, or the Syrophoenician woman that says, yeah, but you know, don't the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall off the, you know, the children's plates? And, and so the things that impressed God were faith, not acts. God was never impressed with acts because truly all of our acts we have to give credit to God for that if it's Him that worketh in us both to will and to do what is His good pleasure. And so, you know, God works through us to do His will and the things that He does, but He was very certain about this. And, you know, we sometimes maybe think that this is a New Testament principle with the Lord's Supper because I, I'm sure all of you know, but just in case you don't know, that the Lord's Supper is the new version of the Passover. It was at the Passover, right, that Jesus took the bread and the wine. And he gave them a new ordinance. And he said, this, do in remembrance of me. And that's the thing that we have as a memorial for the Lord. But if you go, what is it, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I think that's right. Somebody will tell me if I'm wrong. When Paul was talking to the Corinthians, because what were the Corinthians doing? They were getting together, and they were getting together, right, to participate in the Lord's Supper, to have a fellowship, to break bread, and to participate in the Lord's Supper. But when they got tired of waiting for people to arrive, you know, which, you know, we're from the West. We go by schedule, right? Lord's Supper at 8, eight o'clock. Oh, yeah, 8 o'clock, you know. Go somewhere in the East or in Africa. You know, or even Central America. It'll drive you crazy. You're like, we said 8 o'clock. You know, what, what, what's the deal? You know, it's, well, it's, it's a different culture, you know. It, you know, in so many places in this world, well, church service happens when the people arrive. Here, you know, in Western culture, well, you know, people arrive when the church service happens. It's, you know, two different types of, you know, ways of doing things. But uh, that's just, you know, a difference that they have. But... What was happening in Corinth was that people were getting drunk and picking out. You know why, you know, they were, instead of waiting on one another, you know, well, let's party it up in the time, you know. Well, we'll get some more wine. Let's drink the Passover wine or let's drink the Lord's Supper wine and let's eat. And they were gluttons and drunkards in that sense. And, and Paul reprimanded them. And essentially he told them, if you would judge yourselves, you would not be judged. He said, but many of you are sick and even dead because of this very thing, because you're wanting to show the body and the blood of Christ, and, but, but you're very sinful at the same time in what you're doing. He says you need to repent and then take of the Lord's Supper. Because it's a very foolish and shameful thing to want to recognize and celebrate and identify yourself with the provision and the atonement of God in your life while living in sin. Can you imagine if somebody gave you a heart transplant? And, you know, a year later they came back to celebrate. You know, maybe you'll ever see that thing where the, the, the parent or the husband or the person who had the heart, they gave it to them, came and listened to the heart of their relative. And, you know, that's, that's a pretty tough thing to watch, isn't it? And a tough thing for them to hear. I don't, I don't know if I said that clear enough, but they have you know, these, these, um, whatever it is, you know, these, these opportunities where 
perhaps the, the wife or the husband or the parent of somebody whose heart was donated to a, to a transplant receiver gets to come and listen to their son or their husband's heart in the person of that new, in, you know, in the body of that new person with a stethoscope. They hear that heartbeat, boom, 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 and they realize that's my son's heart beating in there. Tough. And can you imagine if somebody gave you a heart to live and to continue in life, and then the memorial came around a year later, and you're over there with three lines of cocaine, a, a bottle of whiskey, and a cigarette, like, ah, oh, yeah, you know, let's celebrate this deal. And they'd be like, you selfish pig. You disrespectful, unselfish, ungrateful. Can you imagine all the emotions and all the feelings that would be conjured up? Don't you know that that's my son's heart? That's my husband's heart. That's my wife's heart that was given for you, and you're over there spitting on it. I think Hebrews says trampling underfoot the blood of Christ and counting it a common thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No big deal. That's why he said this here. That's why Paul retaught the same principle. This isn't just, you know, it's not just a New Testament principle. It was an Old Testament principle that was reaffirmed in the New Testament regarding the Lord's Supper. It was the same way with Passover. What did he say about, you know, the Feast of Unleavened Bread? He said, well, you start, you clean out all the leaven from your houses, all the corners, every nook and cranny, you get it all out of your wife because leaven represented sin. And he said, if somebody wants to partake of the Passover, well, they need to disassociate themselves from sin, which was what, that's what circumcision was. It was the cutting away, the forsaking of the flesh, the removal of the flesh, or the repentance from the flesh, you know, all those things that we want to do, which we ought not do, in serving our own flesh. And he said, I don't want anybody, right, to to be living that kind of life, a sinful, selfish, fleshly lifestyle, and at the same time representing themselves with my Passover lamb. Our New Testament version, like Paul said in 1 Corinthians, like, listen, don't, don't do that. He said, it'd be better if you did not partake of it. And if you would judge yourselves, you would not be judged. And so, you know, do you want to part with that? Do you want you know, a representation with that, well, that's the most critical thing. You know, that when you come back around to the memorial, you're not there, right, with the life that was given unto you with, with Jack Daniels, cocaine, and a cigarette, right? And destroying the very thing that God was making a great provision at a great cost for you. But he said, verse 30, he says, Thus all the children of Israel did, as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And it came to pass on the very same day that the Lord brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt according to their armies. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both man and beast, it is mine. And Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of the hand of the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. On this, day you are, on this day you are going out in the month of Aviv, and it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. And you shall tell your son in that day, saying, This is done because what the Lord did for me when I came up from Egypt. I like the fact that God did it in a plural sense as a nation. But when he gave the command for the remembrance, and it was a command, and even the Lord's Supper is a command, isn't it? This do. 
Now, he did not command the frequency because the whole New Testament and the New Covenant is not based on law. It's based on a love, right? You know, in the Old Testament, it was legalism according to a regiment. New Testament, it's love according to a relationship. It's very different, isn't it? You know, perhaps one of the most heartbreaking things that you ever get to as a Christian, as a mature Christian, usually it takes quite a number of years to get to this point. You know, so often a, a growing believer goes through this phase and he understands what the chastisement of the Lord is. And to a great extent, he restricts the activities of his life and he repents because he does not want to fall under the chastisement of God. But I have to say, that's a very inferior way to live your Christian life. Because it's not really done out of love for the Father, but love for self. Lord, I'm not obeying you. Because I want to honor you and I want to bless you. I'm obeying you because I don't want a hiney whipping behind the woodshed, right? I don't want to do it. And, you know, if, if that's what it is in our, in our juvenile Christianity, well, it's a good thing we're growing up. We're growing up, but listen, the day comes, and it's really heartbreaking and when you're in rebellion and you're, you're expecting to, to fall under the chastisement of God, but the, by that point in time, you're an 18-year-old kid, and your parent says, listen, you're a little bit old, right, by now. I have to say that God won't chastise you forever. He may not chastise you forever. He expects you to get to a point sometime in life where you're doing these things because He's your Heavenly Father. Because of a love, right, that's for him. And not because of some legal obligation, because of some penalty that's hanging over your head as if you have to live in fear of God. That's, that's a very inferior way to live out your Christian life. You want to get to the point to where you want to do the things that are pleasing unto your Father. And you walk in obedience because you want to honor him. And not because you want to keep yourself out of trouble. But he gave the commandment, and he did all these things in a, in a plural sense, as a nation, right? Even if you look at the Passover, well, he did it you know, as, as a family, you know, under roofs, uh, according to a family unit. But when he talked about how you're going to tell your kids, he didn't say, and you shall tell your son, this is what God did for us when we. That's not, what it, that's not what it says. And if you want to go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, you look at there too. I mean, and, and there's no mistaking in Hebrew. It's very clear there's a difference between we and I. And me and us. And, you know, those, there's, there's the difference there. And the language is particular. But he says, you shall tell your son what the Lord did for me. Me. You need to have a personal testimony to be able to give to your kids. Not about some general sense, just what the Lord did in Egypt, or what the Lord did for the church, or what the Lord did. No, he said for your, for your sons and your daughters, you need to be able to say, this is what the Lord did for me when I. A personal testimony. And if you don't have that, boy, that's something that you need to go find, right? You need something you need to go home tonight and say, God, I, 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 need, I need this because I don't have anything to tell my kids. What if your kids came to you and said, you know, Mom, Dad, you know, when did God ever do something like this in your life? And you realize in that moment that you're not able to share Christ with your children. You can't give a personal account. I mean, it's essential. It's something that you absolutely have to do, and it's something that's commanded of God, that, you know, we have these things, and you put these ordinances in place, you know, that when your sons and daughters ask of you, just like it says also in Deuteronomy chapter 6, he says, this is what he did for me and for I, you know, when I came up out of the land of Egypt, and he said, and it shall be a sign to you and on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes, that the Lord's law may be in your mouth, for with a strong hand the Lord has brought you up out of Egypt. And you shall therefore keep this ordinance in its seasons from year to year. And now there's another one. And, the, and it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land 
of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and gives it to you, that you shall set apart to the Lord all that, that opens the womb, that is, every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have, the males shall be the Lord's, but every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if, if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. So, Because donkeys weren't ceremonial clean. They weren't acceptable. But when it came along to one of those animals, well, what did you do? You redeemed it with a lamb. And I'm afraid there's probably still some donkey things going on around that God's not very accepting of. And that's all I'll say about that. But, uh, but uh, every firstborn, he says, you shall break its ne neck. If not, right? It's that loss. It's that sacrifice unto God. And he says, and all the firstborn of man among your sons, you shall redeem. And so God doesn't mean you know, that you sacrifice your son or something like that. But he says, the firstborn. So if I were to have my firstborn, right, you know what I would do? I would go and I would redeem it with a lamb, right? Buy it back. It's the Lord's. And, and you provide a lamb and you provide that sacrifice there in its place, right, to put your dependency on God and your honor towards God. And he says, and all the firstborn among men, you, your sons, you shall redeem. So it shall be when your son asks you in the time to come, saying, what is this? That you shall say to him, By the strength of the hand of the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of the beast. It says, Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. And he says, and it shall be a sign on your hand, and as frontlets between your eyes, for by strength of the hand of the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Um, now, the only memorial we have assigned unto us in the New Covenant is the Lord's Supper. You know, as often as you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. And as much as we might like it to be, there is no dogmatic assertion that we recognize Resurrection Day. You know, in the early church, you know how they started recognizing Resurrection Day? We, we gather together on Resurrection Day, Sunday. You know, the first day of the week. And that's why, you know, it changed from a Sabbath to Sunday. You know, and why we don't meet on Saturdays. We meet on Resurrection Day. So it's actually, you know, shown every week that we meet together on Sunday that this is the day of the week that the Lord was resurrected. But there, there's nowhere in the New Testament that, you know, we're supposed to celebrate Passover. We celebrate Passover, you know, in the sense now, I don't think it's an evil thing. I don't think it's bad at all. You know, we, we started calling it Easter some years back, you know, <laughs> in, in time of modernity, right? And, you know, they called it Easter to compete with pagan holidays. And we have Easter, and we associate it now very much. You know, obviously it's associated with Passover on, on the uh, Jewish calendar every year, and that's why it never falls on the same day. Like, what's the deal? It's, well, it's on a different calendar, and it has to be transferred over to our calendar and why we celebrate Easter. And, and, we, and we celebrate it as a memorial, and I don't think that's bad. I don't think it's ungodly. I don't, you know, the, the church has been doing that for many, many, many years, and you see the hand of God and the, the work of revival and the work in the presence of His Spirit, you know, there and, and working among them, and it's, you know, it's not, it's not anything that I can see that God has, you know, grossly disapproved of by any means. We, we also have come up with our own memorial, Christmas, the first advent of Christ, and that's good. But I'm not so sure that our memorials have been as effective as we would like them to be because the memorials, he said, were to the, the, the essence of them and the centrality of them. What, what, how did he say that you, you'll remember? And that's not what he said. He said, when your sons ask of you, he said, it's this. He says, this is the passing on. This is the continuation. This is the thing that you're doing so that when your sons and your daughters ask of you, this is the memorial. So I, you know, so... How are we doing with our memorials? Well, if we went out, we went out maybe across Arlington this morning and we pulled hundreds of kids out of, out of uh, Sunday school or ch children's church this morning and we said, Easter, what does that mean to you? 
how do you think nine out of ten would respond? Easter baskets. Easter egg hunt. Boy, did we ever miss the mark. A memorial is no good if it memorializes the wrong thing, right? You know, can you imagine taking your wife out on the anniversary and say, look, babe, this is my first four by four. That's what tonight's all about, honey. It's my first four by four, 1970 Bronco, you know, and I, I, took her, I took her mudding in that Bronco too, you know, way back, back, you know, and she decided she didn't want to have to do anything to do with me for a few years and until she ran into me again or something. I don't remember the story perfectly, but. But can you imagine, how would that memorial go over? <laughs> Not good, right? Not too good. You know, what if we pulled the you know, kids out of churches this morning all across this nation, and, and we said, Christmas, what comes to mind? Are they going to say the birth of the Savior? Present. Right? <laughs> Presents, you know, gifts, you know, and they, you know, when, when after Sunday morning is over and there's the piles of, of wrapping paper everywhere and you're like cleaning up, you're like, oh, well, there's another present under here, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know that. And they gather them all together, you know, and they, and the whole rest of Sunday, boy, they are, you know, and you got to like put things together and batteries and this, you know, and all this stuff and, and, you know, totally enamored, you know, Jesus, who? I mean, what have we done with our so called memorials that we have? Well, we're Americans, so we've made them into, we've we fit them into consumerism is what we've done, you know? Like, we have to, you know, and what do we memorialize about it? When he said, when God made a memorial, right, it wasn't filled with all of these pleasures and trinkets, you know, and but what did he say? You know, the roasted lamb with bitter herbs, and he says, you're supposed to do this in remembrance of me, you know, that they were supposed to do it to remember when God delivered them from Egypt, that we're supposed to partake of the Lord's Supper in remembrance of him, and you see how far off base we get. I, I could only imagine if we just lined, you know, Christian kids up, you know, and, and uh, you know, asked them these questions, the parents would probably be there in the audience going, come on, you get it right. <laughs> get, it, get it right. Remember the devotion Daddy gave you before we opened presents, you know, that, that little period of time. But listen, if, if we're going to do those things, and if we're going to, and I confess right here myself, I've done a poor job. I, I, I was too naive. I so wish I could go back and be a dad again because I was too naive and I wasn't very mindful of these things and I did not foresee them and I did not understand the weight of them. And, you know, I, I was too much American and I was not enough the son of God, you know, the child of God and mindful of the things of God. But the memorial is supposed to be for him. That he gets the recognition on that day that, that they're the ones that are remembered, remembered that day. And it was so important that God put these things into place. And when he talked about these things, you know, in, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, he said, this is the very thing. This is the most critical thing. You can, I can only imagine that like, God could have said a lot of things, you know, and, and you shall collect some kind of a temple tax or the raising of funds, and, or you could help the poor or the sick or something like this. But no, centered around all of this, the most important thing that God said, well, what do you do with these holidays? This is why, right here. This is why. It wasn't for raising funds. It wasn't for this, that, and the other. It was for the passing on of the knowledge of God and the Word of God and the work of God to your children. That's the most important responsibility we have as parents and grandparents. If you don't do anything else in this world with your life, you know that that's the most important, that's the most valuable thing you have in your life. You can't take your house to heaven. You can't take that shiny car to heaven with leather seats that are heated and air conditioned and all that stuff. And I, you know, I wish I knew about that stuff. Look, you because know, I'm I'm hot all the time. My kids are cold all the time. I'll get in Jennifer's car and I'm in there. I'm like, I'm dying. Like, what's wrong? You know? And I'm like looking at the air conditioner. I was like, what? What's going on? You know? I'm always driving these old trucks. You know, with a hole in the seat and all this stuff. And you know, and then I finally realized, you know, ten miles down the road, the seat heater's on. You know. No wonder, you know, turn that thing, you know, off and then you have to wait like five minutes for it to cool off. And, you know, 
You can't take your heated seats to, to heaven. You can't take your ha fancy house to heaven, your video games, your computers, your gizmos, your gadgets, your hobbies, your all that stuff. You know, the only thing that you have that you can take to heaven is your kids. Your grandkids. That's it. Friends, families, neighbors. That's the most important thing. And yet we've gone to so many things that are not so important, things that will pass and expire. And he said in verse 17, he says, Then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, Lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. When God leads you out of Egypt, when you turn to Him, you give your life to Him, what we call saved. He begins directing your life, and sooner or later you'll be tempted to believe that He's directing it poorly. You know, if you really make an effort. Maybe you could bumble along and not really pay close attention and not fall under that strife of trying to live an obedient life unto Him. And the way He does things, I'm sure you'll find fault with. And you wonder why, but listen, he knows why. He knew these people. He knew the way they were going. He knew how he would direct them. And I think it's interesting that, you know, God works individually in the person, but, you know, historically he worked in the people. There's two generations here where we get to see obedience come about. There was this first generation that did donuts in the desert. He finally did get them up to the Jordan River, and they said, no way, Jose. There's some big, bad dudes over there. Joshua and Caleb, where are they? They're back there this morning. Man, you guys are growing. <laughs> Y'all are tall. When did that happen, man? I just looked over there. I was like, man, I think they've like put on six inches. Pretty soon, they'll be giant. But uh, Joshua and Caleb, they gave a truthful report, but the people didn't believe it. Be careful what you want to boast of. Well, I did it when I was young in Christ. I literally said things like, I wish God would just tell me what he wants me to do so I could go do it. Assuming that I would, right? Talk about naivety. I too would have gotten up to the giants, you know, to face in life, and I would have said, no way, Jose. But he took his people through a different route. And he took them through a refining route. Now listen, thank, you know they were multiple generations, but thankfully for us, that, that people group doesn't represent an individual generation. But, you know, but we look at our own lives, like 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says, that we look at the progress of the Israelites through the desert and entering into Canaan, and it says, now all these things happen to them as examples for us. And we look at that, and we look about, well, what did God have to do to to create the man or the woman who would cross that Jordan River and who would enter into that, that, that treacherous, scary, terrifying ground of full dependence on God, well, he had to take them to the desert. He had to purify them. So don't despise the long route that God sends you on because it's prescribed. It's prescribed for us. He knows who you are. He knows who they are. He knew already what they would do when he did bring them up to the Jordan River so many years later. And he didn't. He said, he knew very well if I run them straight up there to, you know, to the Philistines, well, they're going to chicken out and run away. Rather, he let that next generation grow. And while he got up to that point, he said, fine, you know what? Everybody over the age of 21, you're going to die. You're going to, you know, rot in the desert. He said, I'll use your next generation. He says, I'll, I'll, I'll use that refined generation. I'll use that generation 
that's going to believe me, that's going to cross over. And so God had prescribed for his people that the way that they should go. And so God led the people around by the way of Israel and of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. And God is a God of order. He is a God of order. Now that's on a people group level. That's on a church level. That's on an individual level. God is not a God of disorder. You can look at this world and realize that God is a very careful God of order. These physicists and metaphysicists come to these conclusions that, like, you know, if the overall temperature of the earth was off a few degrees, we'd be in big trouble. Or if the earth was just a little bit closer, a little bit farther to, you know, away from the sun, we'd be in big trouble. And we just marvel at all the order, the stripes on a watermelon and a zebra and and the, the way DNA works and functions and how the cycles of this earth function and work together, and you find out that God is a very careful God of order. And, and it's not just in his earthly creation, but it's also in his people. The way they went. You go and you look and how he organized their ranks and he put them all together and by their tribes and, and how he went about doing these things, that God is a God of order. Even in our church services, that, you know, if we're going to have a church service, it needs to be in order, like Paul said. I think, was that 1 Corinthians 14? He said, let everything be done orderly. He says, if somebody walks in and everybody's speaking in tongues, he says, they're going to think you're crazy. He said, but let everything be done in order. One at a time. And let someone interpret. You know, and you, you see all those things. Even in your own life, do you not think that God wants order? We're somehow convinced regarding all of our children that God is not pleased with the messy room. Right? We go in there and impose on them this standard, hey, you need to clean up your room. Are you, are you some moral authority or did you get that from somebody? Do you think that you can tell your children that there's some kind of, of ethical or moral backing by God to like have your life in order and don't live in filth? And don't live in disorderliness, even if you want to just think about the management of the resources that are entrusted to you. Y'all remember when Jesus fed several thousand, and what did he say at the end? Gather up all that remains so that nothing is lost. Very orderly, isn't it? All through scripture, from the beginning to the end, and from his organization of things, from the way he lined out his people, from the way he built his temple, you know, that you see that God is a God of order, and that ought to fall down into our own lives. That there's order, not only, you know, in our conduct. Hey, you're, what do they say? You're out of order, man. Right, but God expects us to conduct ourselves in an orderly way, in an orderly fashion. I think he expects us to manage our resources in an orderly way. He's very clear in the New Testament that he expects us to conduct our, our gathering together in an orderly way. Right? He appointed authority in his church. And systematics, polity. Polity is a real thing in the New Testament. If you go read the pastoral epistles, right? That's Titus and, and Timothy. And you find out that, that God is very much a God of order. And, and Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. So they took their journey from Sukkoth, some Sukkot, I guess actually, and camped in Itham at the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. So as to go by day and night, he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. You know, there's another reason, and I think probably the more probable reason, why God doesn't give us our appointed itinerary as his sons and daughters. Although we probably like him to at times, if you're like me. I mean, I, I wanted him to lay it out for me so I could go do it. <laughs> Not realizing that I might miss the very point of doing it. 
God leaves us in the unknown so often to encourage our proximity to him. Because as long as you don't know, you keep on seeking him. And if you haven't lived it yet, sometimes you come to know and you leave off seeking him. That goes back to that thing that you're not necessarily seeking him for his fellowship, but you're seeking him for the information that you want to know so you can go about doing your stuff. But that's the way he led them. He didn't, he didn't give them a roadmap and itinerary. He said, you follow my presence. You follow my presence, and that's very much the same way which we live today. We follow his presence. And we, when we find ourselves in the absence of his presence, well, guess what? You, you, you've left off the cloud, the pillar, somehow. <laughs> I can only imagine it probably happened, you know, to a number of them. I, somehow, I don't know how it would imagine, you know, happen, but I, I bet it happened. They're like, hey, where'd the pillar go, man? Maybe they overslept. I don't know, maybe a group of teenagers I heard sometime in the desert, you know, slept till 12 o'clock and 2 million people were gone when they woke up or something like that. But you can imagine, you know, like, how did it happen? And where's that pillar? And where's that illumination, right? And where's that guiding spirit in my life? And I think that is the reason why. And the truth is, is that if we really understand and perceive his presence, we become rather disconcerned with the timeline and the destination. You know, we, we get it all messed up and think that the destination is the goal when his presence is the goal. Or a certain date is the goal when his presence is the goal. Y'all know how many blessed brothers and sisters in Christ have spent their life and died in prison with absolutely no timeline and no destination? Were they losers? No. You go back and you read with those memoirs of people like Bunyan, Corey Ten Boone, they had his presence. That pillar constantly there, and it didn't matter what the timelines or the destinations were because they had that pillar in their life. Let's pray. Father, God, teach us to be wise. Work in each of our lives to bring about what is your will, God. I pray that you'd be gracious and merciful unto us because we're hard-headed people, Lord. I don't think we're unlike the Israelites, Lord, but I think you gave us the right example for us, God, that we're stubborn, stiff-necked, slow to believe, resistant, but God, we pray, Lord, for your grace and your persistent love which pursues us and sticks with us, God. And that we desire, Lord, at whatever cost in our life, Lord, whatever thing has to be forsaken, whatever arm has to be cut off and whatever eye has to be plucked out, God, in order that we might Stick with you, Lord, in life. Not forsake your fellowship, God. And not count the blood wherewith we were sanctified. An ordinary thing. Lord, I pray for all of these that are yours. God, for your grace to abound in their life. God, for your kingdom work to be performed in each of them. Father, for your spirit to be given with great measure and overflowing God gifts given unto them, Lord, to work in your kingdom and to bring glory unto you, Lord, for their light to shine. I pray for your intervention, God. I pray for your compensation, Lord, in each life here, God, that you might rule and reign and get the glory in each of us. In Christ's name I ask. Amen.